So today we are going to uh, start a new series. The uh, series and focus is going to be about pressing on. And uh, if there was a message, that a time when we need that message, it's today, uh, to press on. Uh, today, the, the thought is to press on that I may gain Christ. Uh, that's the phrase that's kind of driving us this, this week and, uh, and in this series, pressing on. And we're, uh, whenever possible, I'll try to tie in the, the hymns uh, as well, uh, if, if it if it fits or whatever, but uh, if you, Paul, Paul is uh, basically saying here that uh, he's, it's sort of a brag uh, to say that uh, he has all these credentials, and uh, if, if he left it at that, we'd all say, boy, this guy's full of himself. We all know people like that, don't we? You know, that just uh, every time you meet them, they're, they're telling you, uh, everything about them and how great they are and uh, maybe uh, uh, they walk around with uh, I used to have a buddy uh, back in high school that was on the uh, wrestling team and he walked around pictures of himself uh, of and showed you know first time I brought him home to my mom he's like here look at my pictures and he had shown his muscles and, and all that uh, so there's people like that and it almost sounds like Paul is doing this and, and, and it kind of sounds like a at first, we might call it today a humble brag. You know, there's people, there's a term now that they, that uh, really for Facebook people, uh, they call it the humble brag, where they're trying to make it look like they're, they're being humble, but they're really bragging. It's like they show this massive picture of their beautiful house and say, oh, look all the work we have to do now. And, and, and they're really wanting you to see their house, you know. So it's, it's a brag, but it's, they're doing it in a way that you don't know they're bragging or they think you don't know they're bragging. And, and so uh, if Paul, as Paul begins to lay out the, the, uh, his criteria here, his, his credentials, uh, in a sense, he, he's sort of lifted himself up. But don't get lost in that because he makes a point here that's, that's very, very important. Um, and so if you have your Bibles, you can sort of follow along with, with it in Philippians chapter 3. And uh, Paul begins there really was saying that if anyone has reason to be confident in, in the flesh, I have more. Uh, and so as he, as he begins to lay all this out, uh, he, he, uh, first of all, he talks about being beware of dogs. Now, the dogs are probably false teachers. And these are people who, uh, this is what they're doing that's causing the problem. Paul taught a salvation by grace without works. But then the Judaizers and some of the false teachers came in and said, no, yeah, you, you got to have Jesus, but it's Jesus plus work or it's grace plus work. You got to do this and this. You got to keep the law. You got to keep doing uh, the things that you were taught to do as a Jew and Jesus. And Jesus uh, and Paul said, that's not right. That's false doctrine. And these are people who are uh, really, uh, he called them dogs. Uh, that's not a nice term, it doesn't seem. It was not politically correct. But yet, uh, in the sense uh, of what he was saying, these are people who brought all kinds of problems into the church. And, uh, and so he says, uh, that we need to be careful about that. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of mutilation, for we are the circumcision for worship God, uh, who worship God in the spirits. And he's saying there that, you know, it's not about keeping all the, the laws anymore. I mean, he's not doing away with that. He's saying we are those who are living by grace and through the spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. And Paul was just basically mutilating everything that they're teaching, who taught that, you know, that who you are and who you were born into and the, your nationality and all that really was what made you acceptable in God's sight. And Paul said none of that means anything. 
your pedigree, your credentials. And he's basically saying it's not credentials, but it's Christ that matters when it comes to the importance of eternal things. And so he says, though I also might have confidence um, in the flesh, if anyone thinks that he may have confidence in the flesh, I, I'm more so. So if you're going to, uh, if we're going to compare credentials here, he said, okay, let's do that. But I'm going to tell you that I, I have some superiority to your credentials. If you think you're going to get into heaven by your credentials, let, let's, look at, let's look at those. Let's get them out on the table here. And, uh, and then he begins to give these, uh, a list uh, today uh, of things that used to give him so much joy. Things that brought pride to him. Things that mattered to him that don't matter quite as much anymore. And Paul basically gives six ways that he was superior to the Juda Judaizers and anyone else who was claiming to find God or be religiously superior. And so let's look at those Six ways that he was superior. First of all, he said he was religiously superior because he said, uh, I was born on the, he said, the, the tribe of Benjamin. But he, he talks about the fact he was born on the eighth day, circumcised on the eighth day, which was, I mean, by the letter of the law. Uh, that's, that's what they would do. With, with the Jews would, would circumcise their, their males in, in, on the eighth day. And then he said, I, I, I went by the letter of the law. And so when it comes to uh, religion, I'm religiously superior to anyone. I, I went by the book. I did what I was supposed to do. Uh, you know, in, in today's vernacular, you, you know, it's kind of like saying, I was country when country wasn't cool. I mean, I was, I was there. I was, the, I was the person, I was the God boy. Yeah. And so religiously I did it. Secondly, he was genetically superior. He says, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. And that uh, the tribe of Benjamin was, uh, uh, Benjamin was the second son of, of Rachel's. And it was uh, <clears throat> an offspring. This uh, became an elite tribe of Israel. Very elite tribe, and they stuck with the uh, Davidic dynasty and stuck by the by the uh, the law there, and they formed the Southern Kingdom. And so uh, he is saying that I'm genetically superior. I'm from I'm from the right tribe. I come from the right side of the tracks, or or the right side of town, or whatever you want to say. If you want to talk about our genetics, I am born into this. I'm not just. You know, I didn't just decide to do it one day. I'm born into this. But he also said that I'm culturally superior. Culturally, he said, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Not only can I speak Greek fluently, and, and you know, which was what uh, the, the people were speaking in the Koine Greek that the Bible was written in, the, the common language. I can also speak Hebrew. And I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And so I, I know the language. I'm, I'm culturally superior. I, I know I can go uh, with either way. I, I can tell you uh, what you need to know, and I can speak in different languages. I'm also educationally superior, he says. I'm a Pharisee. Talk about Pharisees. And in those days, the Pharisees were, were thought of as people who... Uh, who stood close to the uh, the Old Testament scriptures and tried to interpret them for everybody else, and and you know we have a bad connotation with them, but in those days uh, not so much until Jesus comes along and shows them how the for what they are. But I'm a Pharisee. I uh, some some people would have you know Paul knew the scriptures front and back. It's like a lot of people that you you've, you maybe have seen those preachers that they call them walking Bibles. He's a walking Bible, or she's a walking Bible. Well, Paul could say, I'm a walking Bible. I know the Old Testament. I know the Torah. I studied the Torah, and I can quote it to you. I'm culturally, and I'm educationally, educationally superior. But he's also zealously superior. He said, talking about zeal, 
You can't match the zeal I have. <laughs> Again, well, quite a brag here, but he's, he's saying basically, uh, he said, I, uh, I persecuted the church. Now, that doesn't sound like a brag, but basically what he's saying, I was a defender of Judaism. I was willing to put people in jail. You talk about zeal. Now, maybe I, it was a zeal in the wrong place. I didn't know Christ then. But I, I'm, I'm one who's going to defend even if I'm wrong. I have that kind of zeal that I'm going to do everything I know I, I want to do if, even if it's wrong. Zealous for God. You know, he thought at that time he was doing, he was defending uh, the Torah. He thought at that time he was defending Judaism. And he thought he was defending God. And he had a lot of zeal. But he said, I'm also righteously superior he said, blameless, according to the law. In other words, I did my best to keep the law. Now, he's not saying I was sinless. You know, I kept the law to the best of my ability. And when I uh, wasn't able to, I offered to sacrifice. I did all the things that I was supposed to do. In all these ways, he's saying that he was basically uh, religious and he was superior to everyone else. So if you want to talk about credentials... Paul says you don't, you're not going to hold a candle to that. But here's what he said. All these things that I considered that were gained to me, that at one time I thought mattered more than anything else, yet I have counted loss for Christ. You see, the things that the world values the most Paul says, I, didn't, I eventually come to the place where they didn't matter so much anymore. And the word there for loss and gain are both really commercial business terms. And the idea is that as a, a financial person, you have a, uh, a lot, you have two lists. You have those that are your losses for the year and those that are your gains. And Paul said, I count everything that of those credentials as part of my losses, that I might gain Christ. What has become important to me is not the things that used to be important to me. The longer you stay in the Christian life and the closer you get to God, the things that used to mean so much to you won't mean so much anymore. I remember as a young man before I came to Christ, all the things I thought were important, I didn't want to give up. I didn't have that much, but I thought they were important. And I thought, you know, I'm going to have to give this up or I'm going to have to give that up. One of the things I had that I didn't want to give up was my Beatles collection. Somebody told me if I got saved, I had to burn my Beatle album. I was like, well, I don't want to do that. I paid a lot of money for them. I spent a lot of time, you know, uh, I'll tell you how I got them. Uh, my grandmother gave me $2 a day for lunch. And back then, that was a lot of money. And uh, she owned a grocery store, and I stayed with her and went to school. Two dollars a day. I took that two dollars, and uh, I didn't buy my lunch. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, uh, I, I, my cousin had a record shop. Y'all remember record? You know, well, we got records today. You know what that is. Uh, but I would go down there, and I put every day, I took that two dollars, and I paid ten dollars a week on my, and I had, a, I had the entire albums and others on layaway. And I'd pay like $10 a week until I got them all paid off. She didn't, I didn't tell her I got free lunch. But uh, anyway, uh, I eventually got every one of those paid off. Now, years later, somebody told her, and she was a little miffed at me about that. But I, I, here I am. I've got all these, and I've worked really hard to get them. And somebody told me if I come to Christ, I'd have to get rid of those. And I'll be honest with you, I, it, it seems so silly now, but I thought, I, I don't want to do that. And then I thought, I'm going to have to give up this and give up that. And I thought about all the things that I have to give up that were so important to me then. You know, some of the friends I hung out with or things like that. And you know, <laughs> after I got saved and after I come to Christ, all the things that I thought were important did not matter anymore to me. And somewhere in my garage, in a, uh, in a uh, trunk, there's a trunk full of Beatle albums that I still have and I hardly ever listened to, and they don't mean quite as much as they did in those days. 
But my point is that all the things that you give up to serve the Lord don't matter to a heel of beings when it comes to eternity. When you stand before God and when you're, in this, when you're a million years from now, the things that you grasp so much here and hold on to here and aspire to be here will not matter. The only one thing that matters, only one life, will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And we have to understand that Paul is saying today, it's not that, now don't get me wrong, uh, sometimes the old, old pe uh, preachers would read this and, and, and they would misinterpret that to say, well, education is not important. Or uh, studying or going to seminary, all these things. No, 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 no. He's not devaluing education. He's not devaluing uh, being able to have a good job and all these things. He's not. He's really talking about trying to win acceptance with God by your pedigree, by your credentials. And what he's saying is none of those things matter to God. You can say, God, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. I drive a Lexus, and I, I hope nobody drives a Lexus. I just threw that out there. But anyway, I do all these things for you, and I just want you to know that, God, if you are you know, just like the Pharisee, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like this fellow over here. I give all this much money to the church, and I, I, I fast twice a week. I'm such a good boy. I eat all my veggies, veggies, and I drink my milk, and I do all the things. And God says, you know what? That means nothing. Because your heart is not right. You're not in the right place. And so you can be so religious and have all these things that you've done and all the things that you've accomplished. And when it comes down to the end of, the, of life, it really not mean that much. Because after all, Paul said, if you gain the whole world and lose your soul, what does it profit you? What good is it? And so the things that we strive, and again, we're not saying that we shouldn't, we shouldn't try to get ahead, that we shouldn't try to do the best and, and achieve. And, and the Bible in other places talks about us uh, being excellent and doing all these things. And so we're not saying that, but we're saying that we should not put our confidence in the flesh, in the things that we are able to accomplish. You know... Sometimes we try to look around and we try to pick somebody and say, well, I'm better than that person. You know, and if, and if that person gets to heaven, then I'm going to heaven. Well, it's not about that. And we have to be careful that we're not just always pulling other people down. I like uh, someone said this. It's been attributed to several people, but he said there's so much good in the worst of us and so much bad in the best of us that it behooves us all not to talk about the rest of us. Amen? Uh, it hardly becomes any of us to talk about the rest of us because we all know that we are in need of Christ. So he gives us a list today of things that used to be so important to him and no longer mean that much. And then he said an interesting word there. I found, uh, count all things but loss in verse 8, for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish. That word, as, <laughs> uh, if you really get down to the nitty gritty of what that word means, it's translated to rubbish. Your Bible might say dung. Some other Bibles might say something else. But it really is kind of lock, locker room talk. And, 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 you know, I'm not going to use a, a swear word today to explain it to you, but basically he's saying it doesn't mean anything. It's like excrement. It's like manure. It's worthless. It's dung. All the things that I thought were so important that mattered so much do not mean anything. I count them as lost, as dung, as worthless that I might gain Christ. Oh, that we could see that. We could get to the place where we see how important it is to know God. And that we might, with Paul, say that I might know Him and the excellency of His grace. If we could just have that desire, that that could be our thought, our desire, our hope, our will, our aim, is to know Him. To know Him so well. That's where our uh, song comes into play today, Higher Ground, that I, I picked for the song today. 
It's by uh, Johnson Oldman, Jr. And he wrote some other great songs, uh, such as No Not One and uh, Count Your Blessings. But there were a lot of other songs that have kind of gone into oblivion, which is, not, which is too bad because one of the goals that Oatman had was in his songwriting, you can see it over and over, is that people would not just come to know Christ, but they would know him deeply and intimately. In a way, that's why he talks about higher ground. You can just hear this uh, almost a Wesleyan, a Wesleyan term here that there is a higher ground. There's a higher plane. There is a walk that we can have that's greater than what we go, what we think of. Lord, lift me up and let me stand on heaven's table land, a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. He's saying there's something better than just mediocre Christianity. There's something better than just, uh, you know, just coming to Christ and say, well, I, I'm a Christian now. There's a higher ground. There are ways that we can get higher with God and that we can be above what we were when we first started. We can get to that place. Wesley talked about that. It's called sanctification. Don't be afraid of that word. It just simply means that we're dying to the world and that we're getting more and more of Jesus. We're falling more in love with Jesus and less in love with the things of this world. Oh, how I love Jesus. The word that he uses is it's a Greek word, skubalon, and it's, it's dung. Now here's the tricky thing in this text. Paul is not just saying, you know, I've got to the place where I have arrived. And that I, I now, I, I'm there, man. I, I'm, I'm already there. No, he says, I haven't obtained it yet. There are days that I'm, I'm on this thing and I'm on the right track. And there are other days that things are a little out of whack. And I still desire those things when I shouldn't. There are days when I'm focused and I'm following and I'm running the race and I'm looking ahead and there are those days I'm turning and looking back. There's days I get sidetracked. But there's so much more, he says, in this Christian life. I remember when I was contemplating going to Bible college. I was, I was about 21 years old, and I felt Lord, the Lord calling me to full-time Christian ministry, and I didn't even know exactly what that meant. But I had been down to visit Appalachian Bible College in Beckley, and I'd taken some classes. And I felt God was calling me to leave the area that I knew to move somewhere with a, I didn't have a promise of a job or a home or anything, and to go to college. And about the time that I made up my mind that that's what I was going to do, a friend called who had his own business, was an electrician and all that, and offered me a wonderful job. And he told me he'd start me out on the ground floor and that eventually I, I would, I would be, uh, be able to go on and, and make money on my own and those things, that he would train me in everything. And I began to think about that, and, and I, I, I really thought about it for a little while. And I had kind of a, a dilemma there, you know, uh, you know what do I do? Because I knew that going into ministry, I probably would never get rich and all those things. But as I prayed about it, and the more and more I did, I, I still felt the call of God on my life to go. And I knew this was, I would never be happy until I did. And I'm glad I did. But I want to tell you, there are, we all have a, you know, a cross to bear, but living the Christian life, to me, far surpasses anything I've ever known before I was a Christian. I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. I'd rather be his and have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus in houses or land. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand than to be a king of a vast domain or to be held in sin-dread sway. 
I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. You know, if it came down to it, and you know, you only had the choice, Jesus or, or you know, the life that you want to live. I don't know about you, but I, I, I want to choose Jesus. And I'll tell you why. Because he's been the best friend I've ever known. When everyone's turned away, he's always been there. Every time I've asked him to forgive me, he has. And he promised me a home, an eternal home. A home not made with human hands. To me, that's a reason to serve him. I don't know about you, but if you haven't trusted him yet, I hope that you do. You see, our proclamation is about something better than what this world has. And if you go on and read more, a couple verses later, he talks about holding fast, to press on to the hold fast. See, Paul said, I haven't attained that yet. And we are not the world that we need to be yet. My mother and I used to sing a song. We're not home yet. We're not home yet, children. So keep your eyes upon the Savior. We're not there yet. So we have to keep going forward. We're not there yet. Paul says, I'm not there yet. But I hold the vision. And I'm looking forward to the finish line. As I used to run races, I remember one particular race, Libby, that... If I remember right, it was at Jenkins, and it was on a very tough golf course. And I took off up that hill and exhausted myself, and I've shared this before, but I was ready to give up before I even got halfway started. And I remember thinking, I just want to quit. I really wanted to quit, but I kept thinking about my coach, who was standing at the finish line waiting for me and was counting on me to finish the race. And that was enough that kept me going. I didn't win by a long shot, but I finished the race. When I went to my Emmaus walk, Michelle, you may remember this, at the very end, they give you a cross necklace and they put it on your neck and they say, Christ is counting on you. And do you remember what you say, Michelle? And I'm counting on Christ. And I'm saying today that every teardrop and every trial and every problem that you experience in this life is worth it. It's all worth it. And every time someone makes fun of you for being a Christian, it's worth it. Like the sailor who gets to the other side and looks back and says, you know what? It was worth every mile of the trip. So keep on keeping on. Press on. Because the prize, Paul says, is the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, and it's worth it all. It's worth it all. Let's pray as the musicians come. God, today we want to thank you, God, for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, today that you love us more than we could even imagine. And sometimes, Lord, we think we have to be perfect before we come to you. And we have to have all these things in our life straighten out. But God, you invite us to come as we are, broken, as the world is broken. In our pain, in our sin, in our brokenness, let us come to you, Lord, we pray. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.